Hey, I'm Nate Cass. I'm the first year fellow at the Autology Group of Vanderbilt. And I'm, I'm presenting today a brutally practical guide to starting endoscopic ear surgery. So I think that endoscopic ear surgery is kind of like the giant airship industry in the 1930s. Sometimes you're flying high here above Manhattan. Uh, everybody's waving, everybody's cheering, uh, and everything seems great. And sometimes you're trying to land in northern New Jersey and you crash in a huge ball of flames. So this seemed like a good analogy to me for endoscopic ear surgery. Uh, it can be amazing and it can also be pretty tough and frustrating, but with a lot of patience and some good guidance, I think that uh, everybody who's proficient in ear surgery can use endoscopic ear surgery. So in this presentation, there are no statistics, no results, and no beautiful pictures of the ear. So uh, if you want any of those things, this is the wrong presentation, but it can be pretty helpful if you're just trying to get off the ground, so to speak, with endoscopic ear surgery. The intended audience for this presentation is one skeptics. Say you're not really sure if you like endoscopic ear surgery, you're not sure if you want to incorporate it into your practice for it to be part of your life. Uh, and that's fine. This, is, this can help you to figure out if whether it's feasible for you and potentially some uh, some kind of starting techniques to get you going. Number two, you're a believer. You're sure that this is helpful. You're sure it's what you want to do. Uh, and you're just trying to look at uh, some more feasible feasibility options and to see how you might incorporate it into your practice little by little uh, and some helpful tips to get started. So some things we'll talk about today is why or why not to use endoscopic ear surgery, ways to use it, equipment you might need, how to set it up, and some tips and tricks for maneuvering. So why use endoscopic ear surgery at all? Well, I think it gives you a panoramic view, first of all. So it can be high resolution, wide angle, and with a distal visual source, which helps you to see around corners. This can help improve visualization and clarity, which is good for surgeons and hopefully translates to good results for patients. This is every uh, discussion on endoscopic ear surgery requires this type of uh, picture at least once in it to demonstrate uh, how much better and more wide angle your visualization is with the endoscope than it is with the microscope. Preferably with a really small speculum like a four millimeter speculum like in this picture to demonstrate the significant difference between the two. Uh, but it is true, you know, you really do get a much wider field of view with the endoscope uh, because it's as if you're translating your eyes all the way down the Hopkins rod shaft and looking out the bottom of it. You know, you can see kind of way to the left and right and up and down. You can see all around. Uh, whereas, you know, when you're looking through the microscope, you're limited to uh, that, that very small, very distal uh, field of view. Another reason is to avoid a transcanal incision in some cases. And uh, although this is, you know, this is very well tolerated in general by patients, as everybody knows, uh, we've all seen cases of infection or dehiscence or keloid or some, something else that's a significant problem or disfiguring or results in long-term harm to the patient. And while uncommon, uh, it's nice to not, not have to do it in as many cases if you can avoid it. So it does avoid some, uh, some morbidity, which is good for patients. And another, another thing I will note is that uh, although there are some portions of endoscopic ear surgery that are uh, more, can be more time consuming in certain people's hands, certainly in my hands and in, in some instances so far, I think that without having to close a posterior incision, this can balance out a little bit of the time that you spend fiddling with grafts or other things that you might do for a longer period of time with using an endoscope than you might do with an, a microscope. So those things all sound great. So uh, why would we not use endoscopic ear surgery? Well, this is a learning curve and uh, there are two learning curves here. Uh, the one on the left is is a real, it's an actually a steep learning curve, which is kind of paradoxical to what we normally call a steep learning curve, which is what we mean when we discuss the one on the right, which is you, you spend a lot of time working with something before you actually get any good at it. And I think that endoscopic ear surgery is kind of like that, where it takes you quite a bit of time maneuvering the scope, 
working at it and uh, figuring it out before you actually see progress. And it takes quite a bit of time before you actually see um, efficiency that's comparable to the microscope if you're already proficient at microscopic ear surgery. And so I think that this is the main reason why people are reticent to try endoscopic ear surgery or give it up after trying it for a few cases because it's just not easy at first. It's not intuitive. And some of the skills that you have with microscopic ear surgery don't transfer very well. Um, and so I think that's that's pretty challenging for people, especially if you're like, hey, I know how to do it. I know how to do ear surgery. I know a very good way to do it. I don't need this. So, so using your left hand for visualization is very different when you're used to working in the microscope and you're used to not having to think exactly about how you're visualizing something. Uh, so, so figuring out how to adjust that left hand for microscopic or for endoscopic ear surgery can be a challenge. And these next two points relate more to the fact that not only are you using your left hand for uh, the endoscope, but you're also not using it uh, with other instruments. So you're giving up uh, usually a suction in your left hand, sometimes other instruments that you might use in microscopic ear surgery. But uh, countertension, we often provide countertension for ourselves when we're performing dissection uh, of the tympanic membrane or within the middle ear space, and we're using that left hand suction for countertension. This is something that is one of the biggest adjustments that I find in endoscopic ear surgery is having to find ways to use the underlying anatomy to provide the counter traction as opposed to your left hand. And third, suction. The left hand that oft, so often provides suction during microscopic ear surgery is absent in this case. And, uh, and you're trying to figure out how to perform your dissection while not, uh, having a, while not operating in a field of blood. And so this is the other uh, significant problem that people starting out in endoscopic ear surgery experience is that um, you can be operating just fine and then something small starts bleeding but if you don't have a suction, then it quickly fills up your field and provides uh, a lot of challenges for you. So how can you use endoscopic ear surgery in your practice? Well, there's a few different ways and, and it mainly depends on your relationship with your microscope. So <clears throat> using uh, an endoscope to assist in certain uh, types of situations can be helpful. This is what we call endoscopic, endoscopic assisted microscopic ear surgery. So if you use the microscope for uh, procedures or maneuvers that you're familiar with, you're comfortable with, and you're efficient at, and then you bring in the endoscope for certain portions of the procedure, such as examining uh, a very anterior perforation or uh, looking around the corner into sinus tympani to see if there's any cholesteatoma there, uh, that can be useful if that's what you're comfortable with. The other option is total endoscopic ear surgery where for any given procedure, you're, excuse me, you're only using the endoscope and not the microscope at all. So this can be divided into a couple categories based on what you use that for. So you can use that for selective cases. Say you wanna use it for an anterior perforation where you can't really see around the TMJ uh, transcanal, but you would rather try to go transcanal than to go postauricular or even then you think you're gonna need some sort of drilling or something and you wanna to try to avoid that. Uh, or say you wanna use it for and, uh, cholesteatomas that don't extend uh, fully into the mastoid cavity. And I would say a lot of people that are into total endoscopic ear surgery use it in that way. Then there are people who uh, have completely said goodbye to their microscope and, uh, and they are using endoscopes for uh, for stapes procedures. Uh, they're using it for essentially anything that they would previously have used a microscope for, more or less. And, uh, and there are certain people for whom this is more of a way of life uh, and, a, and a total paradigm shift in um, the tools that they want to treat their uh, ear surgery patients with. The final note on on how you actually use endoscopic ear surgery in your practice is the fact that if you don't use it consistently, you will never become proficient. So to a certain extent, even if we feel like, you know, I only really need to use it in anterior perforations or to avoid a postericular incision in some type of cholesteatoma cases, to a certain extent, if you don't use it for uh, 
in a certain threshold of cases, you're not going to get very good at it. So it might be helpful when you're starting out to even use it for posterior perforations. Say it takes you a little bit longer to do with an endoscope at first than it does with a microscope. Uh, it still might be worth it for the skills that you gain in terms of experience and comfort with the endoscope that you can then apply to those other cases where you feel like it's really adding significant benefit, either in decreased morbidity for the patient, better visualization, uh, better, um, better outcomes. And so I think that practice is incredibly important in this field. What kind of equipment will you need to start out with endoscopic ear surgery? Well, you'll certainly need a camera and a light cord. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is a, a few thousand dollars used, but most people have this already in their uh, armamentarium at their surgery center or hospital system. Same kind of things that, that um, you'll use for your sinus surgery and the hospital might also have it for laparoscopes and such. Uh, endoscopes uh, are another thing that you'll obviously need. They come in diameters of 2.7, 3, or 4 millimeters uh, for typical ear endoscopes. The length can be 6 up to 18. Here at Vanderbilt, we have 3 millimeter wide, 14 centimeter long endoscopes. Uh, I will note, though, that if you're just starting out and you're trying to figure if you want to uh, use the capital expense to buy a set of endoscopes or a, a few sets, uh, you can use FES scopes or wrist, sco wrist, wrist arthroscopes as a proxy because they will have similar, if not identical, diameter lengths to some of the ear endoscopes. So you can figure out if you really think that it's a technique that you might want to incorporate in your practice. In general, the premise of what types of scopes you should get are that they should be long enough so that your hands don't run into one another when you're trying to dissect using the scope in your left hand and an instrument in your right hand, but they should be short enough to stabilize your hand for micro movement. So you don't want a 25 centimeter long scope where you have the scope out here and you're trying to stabilize it, but it's shaking. In terms of ear instruments, you're gonna need kind of a regular set of ear instruments. Uh, a lot of the instruments that we already use in ear surgery are designed to get into different nooks and crannies of the, of the middle ear space already. Uh, you will want a suction dissector of some sort, suction round knife, suction 45 degree um, uh, elevator. And that's because you're gonna want some way to evacuate blood from the suction field, uh, from, the, uh, from the operative field. Uh, we found the suction round knife to be incredibly helpful for raising the tympanometal flap. And then uh, some of the work sometimes takes place uh, in a little bit of blood by feel if you're trying to raise the annulus or elevate the inferior annulus with a gimmick or something. And then finally, you'll need some form of angled instruments. As I noted, uh, some of the instruments we already use are angled, but you might need more angled instruments to reach the places that you can now directly visualize since you have the endoscope to use. Uh, drills, you know, what kind of drills will we need uh, to work in the ear canal? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't use drills yet. Uh, I think that's more of an advanced move. So I'll let any other presenters in this conference decide if they want to tackle that issue. Room setup is pretty important here, uh, obviously. For a total endoscopic ear surgery case such as this one, we'll set the tower up uh, off the head of the bed and then the screen comes nearly directly across from the surgeon with the scrub inferior to the screen. But for endoscopic assisted microscopic ear surgery, this is a similar setup to what, what I used when I was learning this at our county hospital in residency, where the microscope comes off of the head of the, head of the bed, uh, it's sitting at the head of the uh, table, and then the endoscope screen was actually lowered on a boom uh, instead of having a tower, so it made it less bulky in the room. So that was a, a significant uh, help to us when we were trying to set up that room. But if you have that directly across from the patient's head, as if you're doing a sinus surgery, you can uh, go from operating under the microscope to moving the microscope out of the way and picking up the endoscope and looking straight ahead, and you have the boom there right in front of you, and the scrub is just inferior to it. So this makes the transition time between microscope and endoscope less than 10 seconds, and it's really efficient. If you can set up the room this way, uh, at least for starting out with endoscopic assisted, I would recommend doing this. 
For the patient setup, uh, you can do a standard ear setup. Just make sure that you have room for some defog and a micro wipe. Typically, we'll just prep, drape, irrigate the ear canal out, take out any cerumen that's necessary. And then the, the thing that's different about this than microscopic ear surgery is trimming the ear hairs. And this is because they'll get some blood on them and then they'll slime your endoscope when you go in and out. So a few pearls and controversies in patient setup. First of all, how do you keep the tip of the scope clear? Remember that a uh, any cool object in a warm, humid environment will cause water vapor condensation along that object. And while this obviously doesn't matter at all along the sides of the Hopkins rod, if this happens at the tip of the scope, then it's gonna fog up. So there's a few ways to try to identify or to try to, to fix this issue. One is by making that object warm instead of cool. So you can try scope, uh, scope warmers of various shapes and sizes. Uh, or you can try to um, clear the tip of the scope by making uh, water vapor condensation on the tip unfavorable. And you can use this by uh, using an, a defog or anti-fog solution. There are some, uh, there are some uh, products that are designed to warm the scope and to defog it that's seen in the top right. Uh, we use this uh, in my residency. Uh, here we just use defog. They bo both work fine. But wait, you say, isn't defog ototoxic? Well, it's a good question. And the answer to that question is that yes, if you flood the ears of guinea pigs, this is a, uh, this was a poster actually at Academy uh, a, a few years ago. I never saw a full paper of it myself, but, uh, and I, I don't believe it, they ever wrote a full paper, but uh, the, they saw that there were ABR changes uh, after flooding the ears of guinea pigs with defog. So just don't do that. Don't, don't flood the ears of any guinea pigs you see. And, uh, but I think that there's been enough people doing this in humans for a long enough time while using a small amount of defog and have not found any sensory neural losses that, that, were, not, that were not expected. Uh, and so I think that most people feel fairly safe in using some defog on the tip of their endoscope for endoscopic ear surgery. But in general, most people will try to use defog and then wipe on a micro wipe that's saline soaked so that if there is some defog in the, uh, on the tip of the scope and if any does get in the middle ear, it's at least somewhat diluted, but can still provide a good effect of uh, allowing you to see clearly. Secondly is uh, the, the we obviously want to keep our field well lit to have a significant light source at the end of the scope so that you can take advantage of the fact that you're actually inserting the light source down the ear canal instead of relying on the microscope to provide the light source from a more proximal location. Uh, but wait, isn't a highlight setting dangerous? This is uh, the next this slide and the next slide are from a nice paper put out by Elliot Cozen in 2014. Uh, and uh, it shows that the temperature decreases uh, significantly when you change the light source from 100% to 50% for both xenon and LED light sources. And uh, we know that there are some physiologic changes with temperature changes, but we don't really know what a bad, quote, bad middle ear around window temperature is. So uh, I, I don't know if it's at 45 degrees that it really turns bad or if it's at 55 degrees. Uh, so that's really unknown, but in general, most people will keep it to less than 50% just to feel like it's safer, but there's no great data on what's actually bad for the ear. Heat builds and dissipates quickly. So when you turn the endoscope light on or when you insert it into the middle ear space, the, the middle ear space heats up very quickly. This, is, this was seen in a cadaver study that they did. Uh, but but uh, similarly, when you turn the light off, uh, the heat dissipates quickly as well. So when you when you decrease the uh, temp, to, in order to decrease the temp, you can take the scope out, which makes sense. You can actually suction. So they showed that when you turn suction on in these in these warmed cadavers, uh, you with the endoscope light in there, you significantly decrease the temperature, uh, which then quickly bounced back up when the suction went off. Uh, but again, you have to suction with your right hand because you, you can't suction with your left hand because it's holding the scope. So we don't, you know, don't often, we try to, to 
have a suction hand in there as little as possible because you want to be doing as much active dissection as possible to make your, yourself more efficient. Irrigation wasn't particularly studied here, but I think it probably performs the same, uh, the same function by absorbing heat from that middle ear space. You can increase the distance of your scope from the round window if you want to decrease the temperature of the round window. And you can use a smaller scope to emit less light. So finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, practical maneuvering of the scope. Your deltoid, your pec major, your biceps, and your triceps are large muscles that help move your whole arm. And I think it's key to try not to use these to perform micro manipulations of the scope. I think you want to use these as stabilizers. You need to stabilize the scope in a position so that, that you can then use your wrist, hand, and finger muscles for the fine movements that are needed to provide adequate visualization for your, for your dissections. So what I try to do is I put my elbow on an armrest and then I try to stabilize my hand on the actual patient. So I put my little finger on the patient as I'm holding the scope, but I choke up significantly on the scope so that the, um, the camera is resting um, uh, around my index finger or between my index finger and my thumb and my middle finger is stabilizing the, the rim of the, where the Hopkins rod attaches to the camera. So that gives my hand enough length to stabilize my, my little finger on the patient. And I think this is, this has been incredibly helpful for me to be able to have consistent visualization uh, where I'm not uh, where I'm not causing movements that I feel like are are too large and can be dangerous. Another thing that can be really helpful, similar to sinus surgery, where you're fulcruming the the scope on the alar rim, here it can be helpful in a right ear to fulcrum on the incisura. To a certain extent, you can fulcrum on the intertracheal notch for a left ear, although it's it's not quite as easy. But overall, you want to make sure that your scope is stabilized and that you're making small movements with small muscle groups. So in summary, modern uh, endoscopic ear surgery gives a high resolution panoramic view, allows you to see better around corners, you can improve cholesteatoma visualization, and avoids some morbidity if you consider a postauricular incision to be morbid at all. Second, there's a steep learning curve that's primarily related to one-handed surgery, especially regarding suction and countertension. Third, you have to decide your relationship to your microscope, acquire the right equipment, and experiment with your setup. And finally, you have to stabilize your scope with large muscle groups and against the patient to allow fine movements with your wrist, hand, and fingers. Something we always tell our kids is practice doesn't make perfect, but practice makes better. And I think that with, with some practice and patience, uh, you can uh, be like the, uh, the picture on the left flying high and uh, really enjoying the benefits that endoscopic ear surgery can offer. Thanks very much for your time.